Thank you. I want to. Yeah. All right. We're getting there. Okay. Excellent, guys. Okay. Okay. While Tom, while while Tom is doing the fine tuning, uh, let's open up in in, uh, in prayer this morning. Um, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this Friday. It's it's so awesome that we can come together every Friday as men and strengthen one another in fellowship. And for the brothers that aren't with us today, I pray that you watch over them and bless them, keep them safe and their families. Pray that you bless Joe today with great insight and uh, uh, enabling him to art articulate effectively, Father, some great principles here that I know he's taught. Uh, he understands the subject very well, and I pray that we'll be the beneficiaries going forward uh, of this information that Joe's about to share today. So we thank you for your blessings, your presence here this morning, and uh, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Fellas, in the uh, before we turn it over to Joe, let, let me share with you that uh, these next two weeks are going to be quite interesting. This be, it's going to be quite interesting because, first of all, the question is how well do you understand yourself <laughs> in terms of your behavioral characteristics? Okay, and for some men, they understand they understand them, themselves, if you will, for lack of better words. Uh, pretty good, uh, and, but it's not an assumption that all men understand their strengths and weaknesses or behavioral characteristics, but it's really important to do that. <clears throat> and the reason why it's important is because each day we're engaged with people who have a set of different behavioral characteristics. And sometimes uh, when we are trying to communicate or to get something done, working with others, and it can be your wife, it can be a colleague at work, it can be someone in the community. If they're wired differently, and in almost all cases, guys, they're going to be yes. wired differently, okay? Uh, it can cause tension. It can cause conflict. Share with you a quick story. So uh, I was, at this time, I was employed by Constellium. I was a regional sales manager, and it was a new program I had introduced that I felt was going to be a real great benefit for the company. And it started to generate results uh, and things were progressing very well. But I needed this program to be uh, more uh, structured from a systems perspective. And there was an individual who was uh, the inside salesperson, as opposed to me being the regional sales manager. And he was just wired differently. He, he, if it wasn't in a box, if it wasn't structured perfectly, he didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> from my perspective, if it makes sense from a pragmatic perspective and is generating results, it's important to eventually get to that point to structure things from an organizational perspective. But don't let that stop you yeah. in the interim. And over time, you can get there. He was designed differently. So it caused real tension between him and I as I wanted to push, continue to push this program forward. And he wanted to just keep this thing stopped at this point until some point in the future, we were able to structure more of a process involved to make, to, uh, to execute this program. So it only after I went through <clears throat> some of these behavioral programs where I understood basically my strengths and weaknesses, I understood how he was wired. Then I was able to approach it a little bit differently mm -hmm at least with him, and we're able to get this program off track going forward. Okay, so Joe's going to present a lot of details, but I think it's going to be very enlightening for us because if you take away some of the things that that uh, he's going to share with us, beginning with your relationship with your wife, because she's different than you. And if we don't understand that, and if we were, if we now think you, we're communicating in a certain way, okay? <laughs> that yeah. it's, it's, it's going to cause conflict. And so I think what we're about to be exposed to, what Joe's about to teach us over the next couple of weeks, will enable us to be more effective in our relationships overall, beginning with our wives, our children, people that we work with, our colleagues, people within the community. So with that, Joe, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say in this program, social styles and versatility. It's, it's all yours. Thank you. 
Chris, I appreciate it. And good morning, guys. Happy St. Patty's Day. And in honor of that, I did this in green. So uh, I love it. That's awesome. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah we're we're gonna take a couple weeks on this journey. This is a lot of material. Yeah, uh, it's all uh, extremely valuable. Not because I'm showing it to you, because I like to say I'm not important, but you are. So uh, this is information that you can use to uh, uh, to make profound impact in, in producing results and being effective in your life with everyone. Remember, we talked about uh, leadership as the key focus of our of our program this year, so to speak, as Chris introduced it as our theme for the year. And this is just fits right into that. Uh, mm -hmm. Frankly, uh, the number one attribute of leadership is influence. And if you don't have influence, you won't be a leader, whether that's in your home, whether that's in a relationship, in a business situation, in your community, in your church, frankly, in anything. Because the primary definition of uh, leadership is that you have followers. Mm -hmm. You can't be a leader if you don't have followers. So uh, for most of us, that those followers are our family. And, and frankly, even though this is developed for a corporate environment and developed uh, in that context, it's really developed to be usable uh, in developing relationships. Social styles simply means comfort zones. Everybody kind of relates to comfort zones. Social style is uh, what everybody has. Everybody that everybody in the world has a social style. They have a place where they where they hang out, where they're most comfortable, where their behavior is pretty predictable and consistent. Versatility is that ability to navigate around all those different social styles that people have in order to meet them where they are, which is basically what Jesus asks us to do with people, meet them where they are and establish a relationship that's uh, based on quality and truth and, and based on elements that allow you to be enduring and enduring and to be sustainable. So what I have to present to you over this next two weeks really is a presentation. In fact, you all know that I was in Canada back in December. This is one of the two presentations I made while I was on that trip. So th this is this is real life stuff. Mm -hmm. Somebody paid a lot of money for this information, and you're going to get it at no charge. Call it a free sample. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, let's pace through it. I, I, I'm not really expecting to, to give a lecture here, but but so let's have give and take as we always do. But let's start with understanding the reality of leadership. Peter Drucker, for, for those of you that may not know Peter Drucker, he's sort of looked at as a guru in quality innovation. In fact, the quality programs that have been installed at Toyota and Honda and any number of manufacturing outlets were largely innovations that were developed by Peter Drucker. He's a professor at a university in California, and he's really known to be really one of the best uh, individuals as it relates to quality. And he says that there's only three things that can happen naturally in any organization, friction, confusion, and underperformance. Naturally. Everything else requires leadership. Okay, And you can look at that and say, you know what? How true that is, you look at it in your family, you look at it in your church, you look at it in any kind of context where there's other people. And frankly, if somebody is not leading, if somebody is not driving uh, values in terms of where you're going, there's friction, confusion, and underperformance. They're pretty straightforward, okay? No surprises there. Okay, let's go to the next one. Social styles. Here, here's really what this is about. It's a model for understanding people's behavior style. And more importantly, how to use the information to interact more effectively with others. Now, let me stop there real quick and tell you, this is not a clinical psychological study of people. This is simply a way of using what is observed behavior to draw some conclusions about the way people are based on how they behave, okay? It's not intended to invade anybody's personal uh, ideas about who they are and what they are. It's just simply feedback. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing you learn first 
to be healthy in life is that feedback is just feedback. It's not criticism. It's not rejection. It's not argument. It's simply feedback. And if you learn to deal with feedback productively, you'll grow, you'll change, and you'll turn out to be the person God designed you to be. Okay? So the key it is that once you know how a person typically behaves, you can predict how that individual will probably behave. Any of us, all of us, I should say, in this room that have a wife know exactly what that is. Sure. You observe your wife or your children or your friends, and you know what their behavior means because you've made an ask, investment in getting to know them. Okay? Can I ask a question, Joe? Oh, sure. <clears throat> so um, when, when you talk about um, getting to know um, how a person typically behaves, how much time do you think it takes to... Uh, in real time, how much time do you think it takes to understand a person that that way with a sufficient depth to really get a bead on and who they are? Is well, it months? Is it years? Well, it, yeah, it depends. It de really depends on how yeah. how deep you want to go. But but Jay, let me tell you, when we're done with this, I'm going to give you some information where you can literally walk in a room and, and determine behavior style in 10 minutes. Let me tell you what the scientists tell us. The scientists tell us that as individuals, when we encounter a group of people, we make a value judgment about whether or not uh, these people uh, fit what we think. And we do it in four minutes. It's called the four minute window. So that's one answer to your question. You're gonna decide, you may not realize it, but you're going to decide in four minutes whether the person you're talking to or the group you're talking to is somebody that you want to spend time with. And more importantly, if there's an individual involved, you're going to know in 60 seconds whether or not that individual is somebody that you want to have a relationship with. So honestly, Jay, it happens pretty quick. Okay. And you'll, you'll understand that as we get a little deeper in this and you'll understand the kind of cues uh, that your body senses as you go. Um, final two points, relationships can become more effective because you work with others in ways they prefer. We know that preference is the greatest predictor of success. Just think about it in your own life. When you do something that you enjoy, you're usually pretty good at it. So science tells us uh, behavioral scientists tell us that the preference is the greatest predictor of success. Okay, next slide. Hmm. Preference is the greatest predictor of success. Yeah. Think about it. When you do something that you like to do, you don't yeah. even think about it. You do it, you do it well, it. you enjoy it, and, and so forth and so on. Yeah. So if you prefer to do it, you're pretty good at it. And if it's only when it, you're asked to do I'm things that you don't want to do. <laughs> that you have trouble, okay? Okay, remember the general context of all of this, from my view, from what I do, is to launch efforts to develop leaders, okay? This is a leadership development exercise in the context in which I use it. And we know that to start, Chris said it when he opened this up, before you can do anything to develop your life, you have to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, then there's no basis for you to make productive change, okay? So start with that assumption. So the real breakthrough in vulnerability and trust come when you introduce a behavior profiling tool that allows team members to accurately and openly assess their behavior. Keep in mind the context of this. I do this for companies that want to develop high performing teams of people, whatever the endeavor may be. But the same thing is true in life. You want to have a high performing family. You want to have a high performing church. You want to have a high performing network of friends. Why wouldn't you? Who wants to hang around with people that aren't productive? Okay. So the point is, it doesn't matter what the, what the group is. Everybody wants to have, uh, a team that's performing accurately and uh, timely and productively. So we use this social styles behavior tool, which is what I'm going to introduce you to. 
It's objective feedback. It's non-judgmental. There's no natural bias to this information. Uh, it's a platform for honest communication. It contains common vocabulary for individual feedback. And remember, style is a pattern of behavior. It's not a definition of a person. Okay. There's nothing right or wrong or good or bad about what you're going to see. It's simply the facts. Okay. So you don't need to draw any conclusions. But there are clues here that are unbelievably powerful. Now, we're going to look at two basic characteristics of behavior. We're going to look at assertiveness, responsiveness, and how they relate to versatility. Okay? Behavioral approach is used for understanding work life and in particular leadership. Leaders have been... Uh, on everybody's list of understanding for a long, long time. Uh, corporate America has been wanting to know what to do to create leaders ever since corporate America started. In fact, this really goes back, way back, if you think about it, because the Greek philosopher Socrates wrote about this uh, as he wrote about patterns of human behavior. So this idea uh, of understanding reliability and accuracy uh, has been around for a long, long time. It's human nature to try to understand human nature. I don't like that one. <laughs> okay. So this is not something brand new. We're not talking about some corporate gee whiz here. We're talking about an effort that everybody has been focused on for a long, long time. And if you really get down to it, that's what Jesus was trying to help us do, become leaders in our lives, to have principle, to have character, to know the truth. That's as old as it can be. That's what Moses tried to do. Moses tried to install leadership behaviors in a bunch of people that lived in Egypt for a long time called Israelites, okay? He literally was the first management change consultant. He didn't create anything. He tried to organize it. God created it. Moses was left to organize it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have... Huh. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and all those chapters in the Bible that talk about the rules, okay? Because there's been an effort forever to try to organize people's behavior. Nothing new. Okay, so we're going to look at the first, uh, go ahead and advance it. The first uh, characteristic we're going to look at is assertiveness. And this is the measurement of whether you ask or whether you tell. Let me give you a very simple example. When my wife and I go out to a restaurant mm -hmm. and we order something, mm -hmm. my wife always says, can I have the X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always say, I'll have the X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. My wife asks, I tell. <laughs> you get it? It's real simple. Now, if all of you know my wife's Japanese. By culture, they are a refined group of people that have sort of a very permissive uh, attitude in terms of asking, not telling. So she gets a lot of this, not just because of her personality, but because of her culture. But the point is, it's really simple. So if you'll harness the understanding on the ask to tell line, you can learn a whole lot about people. So let's take a look at some of those characteristics. Statements. Ask people, make conditional statements. Can I have something? Well, how much more conditional can you be? Okay. Or the statements of tell or direct. Volume. As you all notice, I, I talk pretty loud. Well, that's because I'm on the tell side of things. Other people are soft and reserved. Interruptions. Ask people seldom interrupt while you're talking. Mm -hmm. Tell people to interrupt you all the time. Now let's look at nonverbal behaviors. Mm -hmm. How about the pace? Ask people are deliberate. Tell people are rapid. Body posture. Ask people lean in. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell people lean in. Ask people lean back. Mm -hmm. Eye contact. Direct, indirect. Response time. Weighted, lengthier on the ask side, quicker to the point on the tell side. 
And their overall focus on the ask side is possible options, always delaying a decision, looking for more options, very common behavior. On the tell side, big picture focus, strategic in nature, big goals. But let's get to them, okay? So, so uh, see how sorry, simple it can be. Sure. Sorry. Uh, I was thinking about uh, cultural differences as, as you talked about the Japanese versus yeah. uh, others. Uh, and I was thinking about uh, the, the stereotypical New Yorker versus uh, <laughs> someone from <laughs> Wyoming. Uh, <laughs> The, the the pace of the the conversation, uh, the intensity yep. of the interaction. So yep. I think these are all relative terms that, that need to be taken in context compared to others of their similar milieu. Is that would that be fair to say? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. All behavior is situational, Ken. So it yeah you, you you bet absolutely. You all heard the expression the New York minute. Okay. <laughs> I mean, people on in New York City are quicker. So, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, though you do have to take that into consideration. There's a whole uh, sense of reality about location and situation. But but the reality is the behavior inside of those conditions really is pretty still pretty predictable. Okay. Thanks. Once again, guys, I'm trying to give you something that is directionally correct, not precise. Okay. There are no guarantees with behavior other than it, it, that it will surprise you. Trying to give you a general sense that when you run into a person or a group of people, you can use these verbal and nonverbal cues to kind of get a sense of whether on, they're on the ask side of things or on the tell side. Now, that'll make a lot more sense to you as we get a little further along the way. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at the next scale, which is responsiveness. Are people focused on a task or are they focused on the people doing the task? Okay, so think about that. You can either be focused on getting the job done or focused on the people doing the job. So just think about that. Okay, so let's look at the verbal, nonverbal cues that can come out of that. Let's first look at the uh, verbal behaviors. Someone that is on the task-oriented side looks at facts, data, their, their delivery is, is typically narrower, their range of feelings and emotions are narrower, their task, their overall focus and subject of speech is the task, okay? Facts and data is what they use to form their description of what's going on. If you're on the people side, Opinions and stories are more important than facts and data. There's a wider inflection to who you are and what you say, and your comments are typically related to people and the relationship. Okay? So let me just give you a perfect example. You walk into a meeting with someone, the first thing they want to do is tell you what they did on their vacation or what they did last weekend. That's not a highly task-oriented person. That's somebody that's relationship, relationally oriented. Just a simple sample. Think about this in the business context. You meet someone, you go to lunch with them, you go into a meeting with them, and you observe all of these cues. You can get a pretty good idea whether they're ask, tell, and you can get a pretty good idea whether they're task or people. Let's look at the nonverbal behaviors. Body language is huge. Is somebody closed or are they open? Look at their facial expressions. Do they control what they do or are they very animated? Mm -hmm. How about their overall approach? Are they formal and stoic mm -hmm. and reserved? Or are they kind of casual and informal and approachable? Now, that's all stuff your brain automatically judges mm -hmm. when you meet someone. You may not realize it but you are perfectly capable of doing this entire assessment in four minutes, okay? Joe, uh, yeah. yeah, something to say. And, and I don't know how this these comments that I'm gonna make line up with your experience, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, and, and I can only speak for myself because uh, I think I do both, and I do both almost every day. Oh, I think we all so, 
We all do both. Yeah. yeah, when I when I'm engaging, uh, and I have a host of business meetings, hmm. conference calls every single day. Yeah. And when I'm engaged with people I don't know, uh, for the first time being introduced, or people that I know very little, before the call starts, we all come on the conference call. If there's whenever there's an opportunity. I want a little. I want to know a little bit more about them, mm-hmm. or we'll talk about something of, of, of mutual interest. Uh, developing a level of rapport that I'm trying to do, very natural, very genuine, and you know, it's uh, it's at a, the cadence can be slow, it can be moderate, but I just want to engage. But once we get beyond that, and everybody's on the call, then. In the back of my mind, I shift. Mm -hmm. Then I go into gear. And I'm all about being task-oriented at that point, about now going to the facts, going to the call, the purpose of the call, what the objective of the call is, and I move forward. Right. So I find myself doing both on the the people side to begin with, and then at a certain point, shifting over and going into the uh, the task-oriented side and getting the call done. Yep. And uh, so as I'm reading through this, what you're, what's up on the screen, I'm seeing all this, I'm just relating to it in terms of what I do every single day. Because I know from a business perspective that relationships are really important for the long term. And in some countries, like when I've been in Korea or when I've been in Southeast Asia, before we, it's almost, you can offend somebody if you, if you shift right into the task-oriented business discussion without first establishing a relationship with them. So I learned early on that in uh, <clears throat> in the Japanese culture, which Dee's a part of, obviously, and even when I was in China a number of times working on projects with Apple, whenever I met people, it was really important to establish a re- relationship first, give that some time, and then move into the business discussion afterwards. Because... If it was ever flipped the other way around, it actually people would get offended. And so that's just my own personal experience. Yeah. Well, b- basically what you said to me is that you've learned how to be versatile, Chris. You just demonstrated the versatility concept that you move to where people are so that you can establish a relationship based on what's important to them. So, no, I, that's totally that's totally exactly where we're headed. In fact, let's let's go ahead and advance Uh, to the next slide, and we're going to show you what this looks like now as we combine it. We're going to take the assertive axis, and we're going to take the the responsiveness and put it together and show you a few things, okay? What's going to happen when you put all this together is you're going to develop four basic social styles, an analytical, a driver, an amiable, or an expressive. Okay, that's how all of this comes together, okay? So let that soak in for a second. And just in case you're curious, the percentages relate to where people stack up in the world. Everyone in the world is one of these four styles. Mm -hmm. This is not just somebody in the United States. This is not just somebody in Portland. This is everybody in the world fits one of these categories. And that's a relative percentage of the concentrations, okay? And Joe, would you say a lot of this can be situational because I could be in discussion and it's all about everything that I know. And I think I'm naturally going to take the lead and be more assertive and more direct and express what I know to help the conversation. Whereas if I don't know anything about it, I'm just going to sit back and listen and try to learn and observe. Mm -hmm. Sure. But this is your, this is not, yeah, this is your, this is your, Based on how you fit these two axes, you're going to fit in one of these four styles. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be pretty predictable and pretty consistent. Let's go to the next, let's go to the next chart. You're going to learn a little as we go. Okay. Here are some characteristics of these styles. (laughs) Analytical people are very serious, very exacting, very indecisive, however, but they're very logical. Drivers are very independent, formal, practical, and dominating. Remember, they're on the task-oriented side of the scale. Let's drop to the people side. Amiables, dependable, supportive, pliable, and open. 
expressive, animated, forceful, opinionated, and impulsive. Those are general characteristics that describe individuals that fit into these categories. You may or may not be one of those things. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you have to be. What it means is in the billions of people that have been studied in the world, those are characteristics associated with those four styles. You can argue, that's good. you may or may not be that way, but that's what the science tells us, okay? Joe, can I ask Joe. you a question, Joe? Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Um, so um, as people get older and mature, um, is it possible or likely or probable that they migrate from one of these four buckets to another? Sure. No, your style is something okay. that is always with you. Your ability to be versatile and not be so obvious about what your style is, is what changes. Mm -hmm. Jay, so that's a great question. People become versatile. They, be, they, they learn how to navigate around to connect with people. Uh, that they meet, but their style never changes. Their style is what they are. That's their comfort zone. That's where you always go. That's how they, sort of your default place, if you will. Yeah. Here Joe, again, this <clears throat> is social style. This is not personality. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Joe, where do you think uh, Democrats and Republicans would line up on the scale? Well, just... that, that, that's, a very, <laughs> that's a very good question, Chris. Oh. Uh, I think they're going to be all over the scale because yeah. these are behavior characteristics, uh, not necessarily philosophies, okay, or, or yeah. ideologies. So yeah. uh, I think you're going to see this all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that. This is pretty natural distribution. Okay. Here, let's take a deeper dive now. Let's start looking at these things. This is where this will start making sense to you. An analytical person needs to be right. Now, I don't say that is a critical comment. I know that in our culture, people that need to be right are a pain in the ass. Okay, we all know that, okay? But that's not the point of this. The point of it is that's their default. They like to be right because they are thinking orientation and they have a lot of analysis going on in their mind all the time. And it's important for them to be right. What do you do to grow a person like this? Well, you teach them how to declare. That's a nice way of saying, make a decision, Bozo. <laughs> okay, get out of the analysis paralysis, okay? Right. All right. Now, let's look at the driver. Drivers are only interested in results. Don't give me process. Give me outcomes. They're in a hurry. They're action-oriented people. And in order for them to grow and be better, they need to learn to listen, okay? Because yeah. they're focused on the task. Both of these groups are focused on uh-oh, what happened? They're interested in personal security, very interested in relationships, and the growth action for the for them is to initiate. They're a little bit like the analyticals. They need to initiate. They need to, they need to move. They need to do something. They need to get something going. If you deal with amiable people, often you get frustrated because it takes them so long to get something done. Okay. Let's look at the expressive. Uh, personal approval is very important to an expressive. Their orientation is spontaneity. Their growth action is to check, okay? Check meaning slow down, keep your mouth shut, and listen, okay? Now, I'm being a little bit, I'm trying to be a little bit funny here, maybe not so funny by using some of these characteristics, but let's take a look at this matrix based on businesses, okay? Okay. In the analytical quadrant is where you're going to find all the lawyers, all the accountants, mm -hmm. and maybe Jay, and, and, your, and, and from your experience, maybe some of the software developers, okay? The drivers are going to be the C-suite people and the, and the heavy managers. The ambulance are going to be your HR department, okay? And the people that deal with the software side of business. And the expressives are going to be your marketing and salespeople. It's pretty straightforward. This is where people end up going with these characteristics. Okay? They need all of those to make that business go. Absolutely. That's exactly right. That's the whole point of all of this. If you are going to establish a team of people, you want somebody in each of these quadrants on your team because they bring those values. 
they bring those capabilities. They bring those, they bring those skills. I have clients that wouldn't hire somebody to come into their board of directors without giving them this analysis. Mm -hmm. So they want to fit them in as a team member. I've got plenty of clients. That's why I do this. I do this with a group of executives who want to put teams together. They want to perform high. They want to create high performing teams. Let's go to the next slide. That the right one? Yes, yes, changed. yes. Maybe? Oh, yes. okay. Okay. This is just another descriptor of these styles. Uh, this is even a deeper dive. This even gets a little closer to the heart, okay? An analytical person's self-esteem need is respect. They want to be respected. They, If you want to influence somebody that's an analytical, give them a process. Give them a step-by-step -step chart of what to do. Give them details and give them statistics, and they'll be in heaven, okay? Mm -hmm. A driver, they want autonomy. That's their self-esteem need. They want autonomy and independence, but their influence is results. And they process information with the options, possibilities, and facts, okay? I once had a boss that was a super driver driver. And when you went in to see him, he would say to you, be brief, be accurate, and then be gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Let's take it down to the amiables. The amiable self-approval need is approval. Their influence strategy is support, and they process information based on how it affects other people. Okay, so if you want to go in and talk to an amiable and get something done, you better, it would be helpful to understand those factors. Okay, you can communicate that. You're not going to talk to them about getting anything done unless they understand how it's going to affect other people. That's why these people are so good in HR. These are unbelievably powerful capabilities. Sometimes I kid about them because it's fun to kid about them. But the reality is they're powerful, positive capabilities that once harnessed properly, they're unbeatable. An expressive person really likes recognition. That's why people go into sales. They get a reward if they are successful. They want recognition. Their influence strategy is vision. Don't talk to an expressive about tactical things. Talk to them about strategic things. Give them outcomes and process, not process. Info processing, stories, analogies, references, testimonials. Now, that's the guy that'll tell you what he did on his vacation. Mm -hmm. yeah. They like to tell stories. They like to blend things into analogies. They're also the person that will take a 10-minute meeting and make it a half hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. So if, if, if you have a relationship with someone, male or female, doesn't matter, or maybe it's your kids, and... You know, all you really want to know is what time it is, and they want to tell you how to build the clock. They're probably an express. Okay. Joe, okay, you, let's go to the final one here. Wait, uh, Joe, hang on. Uh, so, uh, oh, Joe, sure. Uh, now, I, I'm, I'm assuming that there's going to be some variation of individuals within uh, one particular quadrant. Yeah. But is a person oh. always going to fall completely within one quadrant? No. Or they share? A little blend. I think he says no. Once again, Ken, their default is going to be in one of these quadrants. But mm -hmm. most people learn to be versatile, to versatile enough in life to get by. It'd be very, very difficult. Although there's plenty of people like this, it'd be very difficult to live in one quadrant and and be successful in life. You have to learn to navigate around to get things done. So by definition, people have some level of versatility, and, and they move around. Yeah. Okay. Is, Joe, is, the, is he? I'm sorry. Is it the is, it, other way of paying, putting it? Is that you have your primary response and then you have a secondary learned response? Well, that's very intuitive because that's exactly right. If I did, if I did a test and I and I did it to determine what everybody had as a style, what would happen is that you would have a dominant style but you would have a subordinate style mm -hmm. within that quadrant. For mm -hmm. instance, you could be a, an expressive driver. 
or you could be a analytical amiable. Okay, you you have a combination. You have a a core style, and then you have a modifying style. So yes, people are all over this thing. These, but these are just the core. These are the basic core styles of people. Joe, so Joe, uh, if you look at the axis, I'm sorry. Um, is is there an optimal? I mean, uh, if you look at the zero point, the crosshair. Yeah. Um, there is is that the optimal? Well, it is from the standpoint of versatility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I was to uh, if I was to draw this on a bullseye instead of a matrix like this, the optimum would be the bullseye. Okay. Because the optimum would be the place where you would be, where you would demonstrate one hundred percent versatility, and you would demonstrate the ability to navigate into all of these styles based on the person you're dealing with. Yeah. Oh, the only person I know of that can do that would be Jesus. Yeah. Right. Joe, you I was know, just going to say. Yeah. What I'm thinking about, you know, Jay's point as well, this is why it's so important to understand what's being taught today and next week and maybe even beyond that point. If we're operating in a default position, in other words, you know, we're really not cognizant of everything we're, we're being taught today or we're being exposed to. And let's say there's really not an effort to better understand these four boxes, as well as how the person you love or the person you're working with fit into these four quadrants. So if you put all this to a side, you're operating in a default position. In other words, you're already wired a certain way where you're going to predominantly be in one of these four boxes. Without effort, you're likely going to stay probably in that default position in these boxes. In other words, you're going to be less effective of employing some of the other levers here in the other boxes to make a better connection or generate better results of working with others, mm -hmm. beginning with your wife or a colleague. And, you know... <clears throat> Knowledge is power. Knowledge, information is very, very important. And with this, it enables us to be just that much more effective, this, this type of information. Right. But again, without it, I say we're probably operating in a default position where just the natural you is in one of these quadrants here. And if you're, if you're driving for results and you're co not cognizant of the importance of the other three boxes and you're working with other individuals, you're going to drive a wedge in that relationship. It's going to be difficult to get things done. Oh, sure. Well, I, I believe that the, the number one best way to show your respect to another human being is to get to know who they are. Yeah. Okay. Truthfully, and to share with them who you are. Remember, we said that vulnerability is the number one characteristic to build trust. Okay. You can't be vulnerable and not share who you are. You can't be vulnerable and not try to understand where somebody else is coming from. When you have this general snapshot to use as a guide, you can get a pretty good idea of what's mm -hmm. important to someone. And, and you can use it to aid in your journey to understand who they are and what's important to them, which is, you know, really important really the key to developing the relationship. We all know how important that is with our spouses. Yes. Let's go to the last slide because you need to see the dark side of all this. Okay. The dark side. I don't know. Yeah. Because uh -oh. as we all know, people do get overextended. There's a backup style to everyone. Okay. What you just saw was how people naturally behave in no normal day-to-day -day activity. But this is what happens when they get overextended. I point this out in corporate America because that happens all the time. A lot of times you hit deadlines and it, it makes you feel differently than you did before. But these are how the styles act when they're overextended. An analytical gets very inflexible and we've all said this, analysis paralysis, okay? Mm -hmm. Give me more data, give me more data. Mm -hmm. A driver gets very domineering and very unfeeling. Get the job done, okay? Mm -hmm. People that are amiable, they start conforming and basically they give they get very permissive and they shut down. Sure. 
An expressive person becomes right. terribly overbearing and gets very unrealistic. So when you press someone, this is how they manage themselves when they're overextended, kind of the dark side, okay? Just so you get the complete picture, okay? And so if you run into someone that is exhibiting these behaviors, they very well may be overextended. Most everybody is. Is that just, <laughs> you mean overwork, yeah. overstress, yeah, all that, under yeah. pressure? Yeah, beyond, oh, yeah, beyond, yeah. Uh, yeah, beyond, uh, yeah, they're stressed out. They may be overworked. They may have something going on in their family and their life right now that is kind of overextended them. There might be a, an emotional situation going on. There may be a financial situation going on. Who knows? So their versatility is taking a hit because they're so overextended. Oh, yeah. 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 So you got to know the other side of it. So when you when you approach someone that you may or may not have ever talked to before, you can kind of give a, get a thought about it because you don't want to give uh, a, an opinion about someone uh, that is inaccurate. So they could be overextended. Mm -hmm. I, I just pointed out so you can see that uh, you know not all is not not everything is always happy in La La Land. Okay, people do get overextended. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's now, kind of weird. Is I don't know about you guys, but as I've gotten older, um, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to weed get through the weeds here. But um, when I when I worked for a living, you know, I, I ended up being, you know, based on what you're saying, Joe, in the top right yeah. quadrant. But um, since I left work, um, my my almost my entire focus has been on relationships. Um, which means it's, I, I kind of went into the amiable bucket. Is mm -hmm. that, is that weird? Is that possible even? Or no, am I, no, yeah. am I fooling myself? Or? Jay, it's called versatility. You made a choice uh, that you want to behave differently than you did before. And uh, your, your, your normal style is, is a driving style, but, but you've decided that you want to be more versatile and, and relax, uh, and treat yourself differently. And, You've gone into sort of an amiable side. Sure. Oh, no, that's normal. Yeah. Here again, you're not permanently assigned to one of these styles. You 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 have it. This is kind of how you're wired, but you learn in life to make choices, and those choices will shift your behaviors. So if I met you, Jay, 10, 15 years ago in your work situation, I might have seen you as a driver. But I meet you today, I can see you as an amiable, and that was, would not be un, unusual. Remember, this is about your behavior, not your wiring. Okay? It's not a personality test. This is how you behave. And as we grow older, we behave differently. Mm -hmm. But there's still a fundamental uh, driver in all of us, which is your style. Okay. Now we're gonna we run out of time today. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to the next slide and uh oh yeah go, go ahead and go to the next one more slide yeah all right there is real quick before we go into versatility let's let's take a look at a couple more slides real quick there's backup behavior you all have these slides so you can take a look at them yeah. but this will give you a little deeper dive into what people do when they're overextended and when they're stressed out. It's called backup behavior. Okay. Backup. Okay. Now do this next one. Okay. These are just some reminders. Style is the theme of your behavior. Every style has growth actions. There's no best style. Every style can be successful. And the style is about your behavior. I, uh, I can tell you that in every single style represented here, there are extremely successful people mm -hmm. in, a, in our world. This, in every style, there's no one that's any better than any of the others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The final slide we'll cover today is gonna be this quick summary slide. I put it all on one page so you can kind of see what the core asset is, what the needs of the people are, what the info and influencer is, how they are when they're overextended, how, what the backup behavior is, and then what the growth and versatility actions are. You take a look That's at that. You, yeah, wow. this says it all right here. Yeah, you got it. 
system. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Once you absorb this, but you will never, you will never unlearn this. This is, this is unbelievably powerful information. Yeah. And I've been, I was certified in this technology in 1972. So this ain't my oh. first rodeo guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. I've probably done this. I probably looked at 25 or 30,000 profiles of people. And so I, this is second nature to me. I walk into a room and I style people very quickly because that helps me decide how to deal with them. Oh, well, it makes me feel naked, man. How to manage the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So uh, let go to the next slide and I'll tee us up for next time. Okay. We're going to talk about versatility. And we're going to talk about it in the context of image, presentation, competence, and feedback. Those are the four characteristics of versatility. And we're going to dig a little deeper into each of those. And then you'll begin to see how all this comes together. Okay. What you got was the basic fashion. You navigate this world. I think. Yeah. 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 You, uh, yeah, you got the you got the hardware. Now you're going to get the software. Okay. You're going to find out how to use this, how to apply this information. And that's what versatility is about. But we're out of time today, and I don't want to extend any, but that's kind of where we are. Thank you, Joe. This was uh, outstanding. Let me, uh, let me uh, before we close today officially, encourage everyone to go back to the deck. You know, the, the blessing here is we've got these deck of slides. I think it's important just to make sure you go back, <clears throat> look at the uh, diagrams, make sure they're understood. And if you have time this week, you know, look forward in terms of what's about to be taught next week. Familiarize yourself with it. So as Joe speaks to it, it's all coming together. Uh, but I hope all of us have taken something out of this today. Yeah. Uh, any Good any point. comments you folks would like to make before we close today? I have a sense of kind of where I fit mm -hmm. on the graph without taking any formal assessment. Do you guys kind of feel the same oh, way? Absolutely. Yeah, where I fit. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, Tom, because that's what I was hoping you would all do. You probably just with what little you've learned, mm -hmm. you probably have figured out who you are on this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That'd be, I think that'll be fun to share as we get through, sure. through yeah. this. Yes. Mm -hmm. we'll get a little personal. And, and, and it would know be. Know thyself. Know thyself. And it, it, and it could be fun to share with your wives. Yeah. Okay. Oh, she as you, love this. Is you better, under, again, understand where, how your what your behavioral makeup is mm -hmm. generally speaking uh but to share that with your wife i think it'd be very interesting and, and others all right yep okay uh just great thank you joe Thanks, so joe. much sure uh, tom we can probably close the recording